Dr. Yogesh, we are live. You can start. Hi, good evening, everyone. I'm Dr. Yogeshwari, a second year postgraduate student from the Department of Prosthodontics, Uttarakhand State Head Synodent, and your host for today's webinar, along with Dr. Akshita Gupta, UP State Scientific Head Synodent, as our co host. So I heartily welcome you all today. I would start by thanking our founder and CEO. Dr. Anmol Bagaria, ma'am, and the entire team of Synodent for organizing this webinar. Synodent is a global healthcare for all, and we bring to you Synodent International and Synodent India. Synodent is a unique international digital healthcare platform made available first time globally. It is uh, getting a revolutionary change in India by bringing digital healthcare platform that is providing and enhancing a good relationship between patients and doctors and is also enabling real-time appointment scheduling. Our goal is to create an easy and fast access to healthcare services. Synodent International has brought for you research cell, blog section, and educational programs for doctors to enhance their knowledge skills and to keep them updated with the recent developments. We are currently doing free webinars for students, dentists and senior practitioners from India and across the globe, which is different from the webinar era going on since COVID. We also design papers, mock tests and send and arrange textbooks for our young budding dentists thus trying to uplift our noble profession more each day. Synodent is also working for social welfare and humanity to enhance the quality of life by providing healthcare needs and health awareness and also free treatment. So today is the World Oral Health Day and it is also the World Happiness Day. So I would say that the healthier we keep our oral cavity, and the healthier we help in keeping the oral cavities for our patients, the happier lives they all will live. So moving ahead, our today's topic is maxillofacial prosthodontics. And it interests me so much being learning to be a prosthodontist. And I'm very happy that we have an esteemed speaker, Dr. Pinky Mathur Ma'am among us today to guide us through this elaborate topic. Dr. Pinky Mathur had done her MDS prosthodontics from the School of Dental Sciences, Krishna Institute of Medical Sciences, a deemed university Karad, in 2015. Ma'am did her graduation from SMBT Dental College, Nasik, and internship from Nair Hospital and GDC Mumbai. She has done various certification courses in maxillofacial prosthodontics and oral implantology and one of them has been among, uh, has been under the legendary humor curist sir himself at the Tata Memorial Hospital, Mumbai. She owns a private clinic by the name of Premier Dental Care and Implant Center and works as a senior dental consultant at the dental department of St. Francis Hospital, Ajmer. Ma'am is a visiting prosthodontist at Ajmer, Jaipur, Mumbai, Pushkar, Krishnanagar, and Srinagar. Ma'am also runs a charitable organization for rural India with the name of Premier Health for the upliftment of the rural population through the dental health. Apart from this, Ma'am runs a dental academy called the Premier Dental Academy. She has numerous articles in international and national journals to her credit. And she has received various awards for her work in dentistry. She has conducted massive camps like the one in Kutch, Gujarat with her team where she delivered over 290 dentures within three days. So hats off to you ma'am for that. She has also conducted various other denture camps at other areas as well. She has applied for a patent on an instrument called the curvilinear caliper and also a copyright on the denture hygiene index designed by her. So it is great having ma'am with us today. 
So over to you, ma'am. Please guide us with the topic for the day. Ma'am, you're on mute. Okay. Okay. Uh, so, well, uh, thank you, Sinodent, for having me uh, here today. Well, that was a very uh, nice and a very humble introduction. Thank you, Dr. Yogeshwari. And um, yes, Dr. Anmol, we've been trying to, you know, do this since a lot of time and it's not been possible because of, say, a lot of things. So, uh, let's go ahead with it. So, well, uh, my topic for today is maxillofacial prosthetics. It's a huge, huge topic, but still, let's try to complete it within one hour. Okay, so I have already given, uh, I've been given a superb introduction by Dr. Yogeshwari. I don't think this is needed anymore. So uh, I'm Dr. Pinky Mathur. My, uh, I'm a maxillofacial prosthodontist. I'm an implantologist. And when I'm not working, I'm either with children doing camps in schools or I'm doing camps for social work. And when I'm not doing all these things, I'm speaking at a lot of places and I know a lot of y'all have been a part of so many of my workshops. So let's start with today's topic that is maxillofacial prosthetics or maxillofacial prosthodontics. Now, all of us know that maxillofacial prosthodontics is uh, something which is a part of dentistry, but always untouched. So uh, pros prosthodontics includes all these things. All of you all know we make crowns, bridges, we replace everything is missing. Are we really doing that everything? So I'm here to tell you people this, that replacement of these defects is also a part of dentistry, which is a tangent through prosthodontics. So whenever you have a patient coming into your dental OPD who comes up with such a problem and has been referred by say your onco surgeon to you for say whatever reason you the first thing goes into your head is that this patient also deserves to look good this patient deserves to function normally this patient deserves to appear human in every way so here we are to discuss how we can help these people go ahead with their life smoothly even after battling cancer or say any other traumatic defects so uh, maxillofacial prosthodontics as by far, I have just explained that it is something that we are going to, uh, you know, help the patient with anatomic and functional cosmetic reconstruction by giving a lot of prosthetic parts. So you can find the definition in any of the books. So basically what we are going to do is we are going to use maxillofacial prosthesis to replace the missing part of these patients apart from what is inside the mouth, also outside the mouth. So... When we come about uh, the aim, why am I doing maxillofacial processes? Of course, for preservation of residual structure, imagine your palate being cut off due to, say, some kind of onco surgery, or you might have, a, a, say, cleft palate, cleft lip. You can just imagine the trauma and the type of functional uh, shortcoming these patients go through because of all these things. So basically, what we're doing through maxillofacial prosthetics is trying to get the patient back to the function. We're trying to improve the aesthetics of the patient, and we're also trying to preserve what is already being cut a part of it what is remaining we want to keep the patient happily living with it ever after because when we uh, come to uh, meet a patient who has just been treated with onco surgery what we see is that uh, onco surgeon ne uh, jitna surgical part tha wo kar diya and now what the patient is not able to swallow patient is not able to speak so here is the part where we come through prosthesis in letting the patient get back to the normal life what it has already lost due to say whatever pathological defect so uh, when I talk about maxillofacial prosthesis, uh, we have different causes for oral tissue losses that we are going to replace. So there might be congenital causes like cleft lift, cleft palate. You might have traumatic causes, as I said, gunshot injuries. There might be pathological or with which are treated with radical surgeries, any kind of onco uh, case or any kind of oncological pathology. And this results in two type of factors because whatever is missing or whatever is pathological is resected. So this the resected part leaves behind defects. So these defects are either intraoral defect or extraoral defect. So now uh, the defects are classified as maxillary, mandibular and tongue when it comes to discussing about intraoral prosthesis. We are going to talk about on a basic introduction of each of these factors. Then we have extraoral defects where we have facial prosthesis, nasal prosthesis, orbital, auricular. We have combination prosthesis. All of this is going to be discussed and you're going to be well versed with what a maxillofacial prosthodontic part of your dentistry can do. So coming down with intraoral prosthesis, when I talk about intraoral prosthesis, I talk about defects which are going to include your maxilla, your mandible, and to some extent, your tongue also. 
So when uh, we talk about maxillary defects, we have again what I explained earlier, congenital and we have acquired defects. Okay, so now we'll start with acquired defects. So most of the acquired defects, I, as I've mentioned earlier, are due to surgical resection of tumors or due to trauma or whatever reason. So imagine that after the trauma or the tumor, you leave the patient with this kind of a defect or you can say uh, this kind of a big hole in the mouth where the nose knows what is going on in the mouth, the mouth knows what is going on in the nose. By this word I mean, just imagine this patient living this kind of a life and the patient not being able to speak, not being able to swallow. So most of the patients who come to me say that, Doctor, I have cancer, but how do I live I Okay, so we as a maxillofacial prostodontist are going to come into picture and get these patients back to functioning. Okay, for example, you have a punctured car. You get the tires done, you get everything done, you get it fixed very nicely. But it's not going to be of any use to you. So we as a maxillofacial prostodontist are help, going to help you chalao that gaadi. So before I get into maxillofacial prosthetics of the palate in detail per se, because this is most of the thing which is which you're going to encounter in your clinic where uh, the onco surgeon will deflect, uh, directly write a referral to a dentist for rehabilitation of the lost structure. So before we get into the picture, why is it important to restore? Jaha kata, vaha chhod do. Restore kyo karna hai? So try to get into the anatomic part of it. Now here, as you can see, this is your hard palate. This is your soft palate. This is the pharynx. This is the oral cavity. And this is the nasal cavity here. So during function, when you are going to eat food, the food is going to be pushed with the help of the tongue into say your entire esophagus so here what is going to happen that your soft palate is going to raise due to whatever pressure and activation of your soft palatal muscles and it's going to touch your pharynx behind and block the regurgitation of food into your nose and it's going to help swallow and push the food into your esophagus at the same time the epiglottis over here is going to become active so that it can close your trachea and it can uh what do you say uh uh, it can avoid the food getting into your windpipe also. So here, as we talk about resection of defects of the heart palate, what we are doing, we are talking about some kind of, uh, say, carcinoma or pathology here, because of which this part of the palate had to be resected. Okay, so now I hope you can easily visualize what I'm talking about. Imagine this entire part of the palate being rejected, resected. Now, whatever you eat is going to go into your nose, whatever you're not going to be able to talk properly because the resonating chamber, that is your mouth, which is the resonating chamber. When you try it, the air, the thrust of air, which comes out from your larynx is going to resonate into your mouth, into your nose. And that is how we are able to speak. But now there is no seal of the chamber because the portion where the seal was supposed to be formed was resected. So here, by uh, helping this patient rehabilitate to a normal life being, what are we doing? We are going to replace this area of the palate once again with the help of prosthesis. So coming back to my previous slide. So here again, we have certain part of this palatal area resected. The patient can't speak, the patient can't eat. So by trying to close the defect, by trying to close the defect, what I mean is by trying to seal back that defect. You know, the patient is going to be able to eat everything properly. The, there's the, we are trying to uh, break the barrier between the oropharynx and the nasopharynx so that the patient can swallow and speak properly during function. So basically, a maxillary defect requires the placement of an obturator for normal speech and swallowing. This is what an obturator is. So this is the basic concept. I basically believe whatever you do, you should know the reason behind it. So that it gives you the zeal and it gives you the thrust to do that thing in a more technically correct way. So uh, obturator is something which is going to restore your oral nasal partition. As I just explained, this partition, which has been resected because of the cancer is going to be resected, is going to be resected because of the cancer. It's going to be replaced again, or you can say sale, sealed again with the help of an obturator prosthesis. What is the function of the obturator? As uh, by far, I'm damn sure that talking about so many things, you're very clear that it is used for the uh, very, very, very important purpose that is eating so that whatever you're eating in the masticatory function does not have a contact with your nasopharynx. It can help to keep your wound area clean because it is separating your oro and the nasopharynx again. It's going to help in recontour the palatal structure. It's going to help in contour your speech. It's going to, of course, give you a lot of uh, morale boost. Like imagine... Uh, 
uh, these patients, uh, if you have met these uh, cancer rehabilitated patients or these patients who have undergone radical surgeries, they are shy of drinking water in public, going out in public. They have so much mucus discharge, discharge everywhere. So just imagine these people getting back to normal life and the boost in morale they get when they're able to eat and function normally, even in their social lives. So now there are three phases of treatment when we talk about an obturator. You have an immediate obturator, you have a definitive obturator, and you have a temporary obturator. We would see each of these in detail. And I want you all to be so thorough with the concept that you know that what a maxillofacial prostodontist does. And to some extent, if you can apply it, you can also do maxillofacial prostodontics on your level. So uh, the first part is the surgical obturator. Now, what a surgical obturator is. Now, when a patient comes to you for say, uh, or to an onco surgeon or to an oral surgeon for resection of a particular part of the defect, say this defect of the palate had to be resected. So now what do we do is before the surgery is planned, we make impressions for the defect. We mark the area of this defect and we make a plate for this area, which is again inserted in the patient's mouth during the surgery itself. So what happens is as soon as the patient is out of his general anesthesia, he can at least get back to his normal swallowing, speaking, drinking of fluids, water, and he is not disappointed at the very first level where Jesse surgery hui, his oronasal and his uh, oropharynx and nasopharynx transmission started and he's already demotivated. He starts lo losing a lot of hope on it. So placing a surgical obturator just before the surgery plays a great role in getting the patient back to his function. So now we have surgical obturators for hard and soft palate. Let me be very clear when we talk about surgical obturator, it is just the plate. We do not extend into the defect. So here it's a small preclinical activity um, a picture that I have put here. For example, this is an ideal cast. Uh, imagine this area to be resected cause of cancer. So what we're going to do is make a plate for this area. What you can see here is the plate. And then you make a putty index for this area. Once you make the putty index, now in this case, this was possible because most of the structures were normal, say normal here. Or for example, you have most of the structures retained here. Once you make the index, you place this uh, made plate in the index and you cut the resection part planned on the cast. Now, once you place, you remove this resected part, place your cast again into the index, remove whatever um, area you uh, don't plan to uh, keep after the surgical resection and build that area again with acrylic. So now what you get, what is uh, in your hand is you have a plate which is ready, which can be placed into the patient's mouth of the a same uh, uh, structure or the same measurements which can be placed post-surgery. Now, because this is from a preclinical activity uh, book, teeth have been placed here, but we suggest do not place teeth or do not place uh, any kind of occlusion load on a surgical obturator because this is going to cause friction, this is going to delay in healing. So we generally do not suggest going in with teeth for, uh, say, surgical obturators. We just plan for plain uh, plates. For example, now this is an example of a clinical case where you can see that this entire portion is planned for resection, say for whatever reason. And now after resection of this part and scraping of this part, we make a clear acrylic plate here, which is placed into the patient's mouth during surgery so that the patient can come back to function and doesn't have to stay with that hole there. So advantages, as I'm explaining, you're already getting clear with it. Normal speech, eating habits is going to uh, prevent collapse of the tissue. Facial symmetry is going to be maintained. And of course, mental well-being, the psychological part plays a very, very big role in such patients. So this is one of the cases uh, where uh, we had, where this patient was referred to me by an onco surgeon for a resection of this <coughs> mucormycotic lesion. <coughs> Excuse me. And I made a plate for this, uh, this and I sent it back. Not much was done to be done. Another case here, which we can see is this patient had uh, an adesocystic lesion of the palate. Again, this uh, case was sent. We resected this uh, part from here and then we placed a uh, we placed a acrylic plate, which was sent to the surgeon, which he placed intra-orally after his surgery or after his resection part. So now uh, the next part coming into being, we spoke about the hard palate. Now we have to talk about the soft palate also, because as I explained earlier, soft palate is that barrier which is going to help in deglutition, is going to help in speech by causing the barrier so that the food is not pushed into the nasopharynx. And also at the same time, the food can easily enter into your digestive system to the esophagus and not run here and there because of this unwanted pathological uh, or you say post-surgical holes. So in this, before I get to this, I will explain to you a small concept again, because it's easier to go ahead with concepts. So here, what we see is, 
again i have the same diagram which i explained about the soft palate and the hard palate now imagine this part from the other view now over here you can see this is the soft palate structure here so here you have the hard palate here you have the soft palate you have the musculus ovulae here and over here you have your pharyngeal walls and you have your pharyngeal muscles so now what is going to happen during speech or during swallowing there has to be a con this area is going to be elevated and going to touch your posterior pharynx at the same time your lateral pharyngeal walls are going to come closer to this area to form the complete seal this will be more clear to you from this diagram now you can see what is happening in the soft palate during uh, the mastication and during the uh, speech process now for example in the mastication process your tongue is being thrust upwards and during the swallowing uh, the muscles are pushing this and touching the posterior phalangeal wall okay now what the same thing what we observe now observe the same scenario that the posterior phalangeal wall has been touched here and from the other two sides we are having the lateral uh, pharyngeal muscles which are going to come and attach and going to form the complete seal so now the problem comes here when we are supposed to replicate the same thing on the soft palate before the surgery so what i mean here is that you have to plan a very good way so that the lateral pharyngeal walls can touch this area form the seal and you can easily execute the functions so uh, what do we do is we make a basic uh, surgical obturator and the relining is done with the help of a temporary temporary denture reliner in the patient's mouth with the help of functions itself what you can see here see how the how well the relining material has relined with in function and it is in contact with the lateral pharyngeal walls as well as with the posterior border of the pharynx so this is what is the surgical uh, obturator for what we call as a soft palate now delayed surgical obturators these were all your immediate ones which you placed in the surgical room and now there are some cases where because of say whatever reason either uh, your surgeon doesn't want a surgical plate or the patient is not able to reach you in time or the surgeon is not able to reach you in time so over here we have certain defects which are open defects but they are still in the healing phase so what do we do is we go on making surgical plate obturators for this patient again so the healing also takes place and the obturator can add to its role of separating the oral and the nasal part so over here what you can see one of my cases where this patient was referred to me later after the surgery so even though we got beautiful impressions uh, of the defect which you can see here we have got this beautiful extensions and uh, we have got a very good recording of the defect walls but we had were just instructed to go in with a surgical plate because this patient's healing had not taken place so we couldn't give a obturator to the patient it's very important before you go in for the definitive obturator the healing of the entire defect has to take place so then we made very simple we blocked this out with wax and we made very simple interim obturator for these patient again another case of a delayed surgical obturator from an article where a surgical obturator was relined with certain relining material and it was only used as a interim obturator now why a delayed surgical obturator is a little important and why is it converted into an interim obturator now when the healing of this defect is going to take place after certain time there's going to be collapsing of the tissues because the healing is going to take place and the tissues are going to be collapsing all the time and sometimes it becomes so narrow that it is practically impossible to restore these defects to function and it is impossible to restore a these defects prosthetically so what do by what do i mean by using an obturator or interim obturator in these cases function definitely important but it also prevents collapsing of these tissues a bit too much and you know it helps in nice healing and a nice contour so that we can prosthetically give a good functional tissue uh, to the prosthesis so interim obturator is given 7 to 10 days after as we have already discussed about this and uh, the relining of the prosthesis will take about from say 6 to 1 year because 6 months to 1 year because they say that the healing keeps on taking place there are tissue changes for a year in these patients because say whatever reasons because most of the patients have also undergone a lot of uh, uh, chemotherapies and a lot of uh, radiation therapies so because of this the healing also has different 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 roles in these patient so uh, we suggest to go in for a definitive after a year uh, so here in this an interim obturator is molded with the help of rim seal 
Now, this is another case uh, where we have seen that this patient was again referred to as after surgical resection. Now, here we can see that the uh, epithelium is not completely here. There was a skin graft uh, lining done, and here we can see that certain epithelial uh, uh, healing is still taking place. So, this patient was not very comfortable uh, with this area because it was constantly being inflamed with whatever food he was eating and uh, whatever surgical obturator we had given him had to be discarded because it had started moving into the defect. So we gave him a very, very simple prosthesis. He could eat very well with it. The prosthesis was healed and as and when the healing took place and then he was converted into definitive case after a year, but he was quite happy with the function because he could masticate, speak, drink water normally. <coughs> Excuse me. Now we go to definitive obturators. So a uh, definitive obturators is a big challenge. Converting this into a definitive prosthesis, definitive means it is, it's going to stay with the patient for a lot of time. It's going to be uh, something on which the patient is going to be uh, relying on. It's going to be like, uh, you say the crutches for the patient uh, lifelong to have the functions uh, executed very, very normally. So here you need a lot of, uh, say, concepts, a lot of technicalities, and you need a lot of, uh, say, patients also with the patient because here a lot of changes have taken place and you have to execute a lot of things and a lot of challenges which you have to go through. Now, the most important thing is multiple axis of rotation. I'm very sure that all of you all are very well versed with cast partial dentures or have an idea about it for sure. Now, when we talk about axis of rotation, say, for example, in this kind of a defect, now this area is your defect area. So there are going to be like three major axes of rotation, which your prosthesis has to overcome to be stable in the patient's mouth. Now, because this defect area is going to be so big, we are going to have very little palatal coverage for stability. Of course, because palatal structures are not there, but they say that if your pre-maxillary area on the defect side is uh, conserved, it is a better uh, prosthesis, it is a better um, case for a better prognostic replacement. But unfortunately, for cases like this, where you can see it's a midline defect, most of the pre-maxillar part has been resected. So the movement of the prosthesis is going to take place along this axis, where the prosthesis is going to keep moving into the defect. This picture will make it very clear for you. Now, if you can see in this case, there'll be significant movement of the prosthesis into the defect on occlusion because the fulcrum line is somewhat going to be passing through this area through over here and the prosthesis is going to keep moving in the defect out of the defect and also there's going to be a role of gravity but somehow uh, we are going to discuss how to overcome these things okay so of course there's going to be an axis of rotation passing through both the rests of the abutment there is going to be an axis of rotation passing through the distal most um, abutment why because when the patient is going to masticate on the posterior teeth definitely the prosthesis is going to try to move on the uh, be behind part but you this this uh uh, area of axis of rotation can definitely be dealt with. Now, uh, talking about the uh, next part, which is very important, uh, is about the compromise stability, retention, and support. Of course, on the defect side, you cannot expect any kind of, uh, say, uh, retention uh, naturally. So you have to go into the defect, which I'll be explaining, and get that support for your uh, stability of the prosthesis. Definitely with the help of guide planes and good retentive undercuts on the remaining teeth side or on the residual uh, palate side, you can get good kind of retention with different retention aid, say, implants or adhesives. So uh, when I talk about the prognostic factors, what you're going to keep in mind when you see an obturator success. So the first and the most important thing, you have a patient here and you have the defect here. Just imagine there being a defect. Just don't visualize this obturator here. Think it is a normal open defect. For example, it looks something like this. So you have a defect here and you have to replace it with, uh, for the patient. Now, what you can see here very clearly is a lining of a skin graft. If you have a very well lined skin graft, a very well lined healing skin graft, you will be having superb, super prognosis of this patient because the lining grafts are very stable than an epithelial graft because the lining graft is going to be so good on which the prosthesis can very, very nicely heal and a prosthesis can very nicely rest on this graft. Plus, you are going to have a small junction between the skin graft, which is going to be lined here in the defect, and the mucosal portion. By this, what I mean is, again, coming to this diagram, you can see this part here. You can, you can see the mucosal portion here, and you can see the inter-defect area here. So you're going to have a small undercut here. So this is also going to be very, very useful to you for replacing the 
prosthesis. Apart from this, the lateral wall has to be taken into consideration. You have to extend it as much as you can on the lateral wall. This is going to help you in retention a lot. Okay. And then you're going to have a small extension, the nasal aperture, not too much extension because it's going to interfere with the breathing of the patient. Okay. And apart from this, on the other side, as I said, the normal side, you can use denture adhesives. You can use good amount of, um, say, glass, or you can use very good also integrated implants for retention and its abutment teeth. So now looking at a good obturator prosthesis, a nice one, which has been made an ideal prosthesis, what you should look for. Now you should see a very well vertically extended prosthesis laterally into the defect, not medially, because it is going to cause interference with the breathing. So we have to help rely the prosthesis on the lateral lining of the defect. Apart from this, you can see there's a good impression of the base of the skull so that it is very well in contact with the base of the skull, the remnant area after surgery, what was left here. It can be very well seen here. Apart from this, there are going to be two other very interesting concepts which you have to see. One is the posterior extension should be right very well so that it can very, very well go and adapt to the palatal uh, surface area of the posterior part of the obturator so it can go and contact the pharynge pharyngeal muscles very well so that all the functions can be executed very well and the soft palate is uh, very very uh, important uh, to be very uh, you can say very technique sensitive and to be very compatible with your obturator of course you should see a good amount of uh, vertical extension in your lateral border which can be seen if you you should have a good amount of base of the skull contact okay so all these things are very very important for a completed obturator contour another important Important thing you have to be able to uh, record a nice uh, lateral movement of your ramus of the mandible on the lateral part by this what i mean is over here somewhere on the lateral part of the obturator a good impression of the movement of the ramus of the mandible should be recorded plus uh, a very uh, important concept where everybody talks about the bulbs of the obturator now what a bulb what i mean if you can see this over here this is an open part it's going to go into your defect this is as it is going to go into your defect now you can see this is open here it is quite con concave and it is open here this is a open bulb obturator this area is called as the bulb the area which goes into defect is your bulb of the obturator so you can see this area is an open area so this is an opal bulb obturator if this area was covered with acrylic or with silicon or say for whatever reason it would have been a closed bulb obturator now why is an open bulb obturator better of course it is going to reduce that weight of the acrylic and first and foremost we are also the, uh, you know uh, tense fighting with the force of gravity axis of rotation and plus you give a heavier obturator so it's always going to keep falling so all your other principles are not going to work that well so what you're going to do in this case is you're going to give an open bulb obturator if possible second advantage whatever mucosal secretions are going to be collected into this obturator bulb can be easily cleaned by the patient whenever the patient wants it and it's going to be a very very uh, hygiene maintaining kind of process and weight of the prosthesis is already going to give patient that confidence so uh, another uh, important part, very small concept, a very small retentive feature, which uh, is included in the obturator and it's going to give you this uh, good support and retention is going to be this little extension in the nasal part of the soft palate. What you can see, this is the obturator prosthesis here. This prosthesis is extended a little bit onto your soft palate area over here. Okay, this area, the soft palate is relaxed, but also a little bit part of your obturator is on to your soft palate on the nasal part. This is the nasal part and the soft palate here. So little bit of extension is on to your soft palate. So here you're again getting an undercut plus what's happening when the patient is speaking or when the patient is swallowing, this part is going and becoming activated and the seal is formed here. Now, once the seal is formed here, it is going to again enhance your masticatory effects. There is no, there's going to be no chance of leakage whatsoever from this area also. So when you explain this with the diagram, can you appreciate the same thing? Now see, this little part is going to go into your nasal portion. This is going to be the obturator. And this little part is going to be extended over the soft palate. And this is going to act in retention. It is going to, you know, uh, be very uh, helpful in trying to block those slight, um, you know, leakage of fluids here and there.
So the clinical procedures of obturator is going to be you make an impression for a RPD framework. You make impression with alginates or polysilogazine materials. After this, you make a framework first for the cast with all the principles of your cast partial denture. You do border molding in that area. You border mold that areas with a low fusing compound because the flow of this working time is very good and the flow is very good of this low fusing compound. Now, uh, next is uh, your you take wash impressions with the help of polysulfide materials. Now, uh, just keep in mind that this impression has to be minimally displaceable. Like, uh, try to scrape enough from your uh, initial uh, uh, material which you have made for an impression and make it a very passive impression. If it is an active impression, it is going to really trouble you with a lot of irritation on the tissue and the patient is not going to be able to wear the prosthesis because healing in the defect is really slow than the other areas of the prosthesis. So uh, to check whether uh, this, a, this is an active or a passive prosthesis, we can use um, thermoplastic wax and the areas where the wax is exposed, we know that area has to be trimmed and recorded again and it is a passive area. Now, when you talk about a completed prosthesis, with all, all the concepts and with all the, um, uh, with all the basics that I have applied uh, till now, an obturator prosthesis becomes very, very successful and using it for the patient becomes much more easier if it is made with some little bit of technical aspects here and there. So uh, again, uh, once the prosthesis is made to identify whether the prosthesis is a passive or an active, we use uh, a pressure indicating paste. For example, if the patient has um, an occluded salivary gland because of uh, the chemotherapy body is gone through, then you can use disclosing wax to determine these areas. So this is how your disclosing wax should look. You have no active areas, no exposures, and you have a uniform thickness. So you know that this, this is a passive prosthesis. So now obturators of the uh, nasopharynx, why when you have to extend it into the nasopharynx? So again, come back to the same thing where a, lot, a big part of the palate has been resected. So uh, in these cases, imagine how the patient is going to speak, talk, because so what we're going to do with the nasopharynx defect is we are going to replace this part. We are going to replace this part so that the nasopharynx and the oropharynx is going to be separated. So what do we do is we just make a simple extension onto your impression materials so that you can record this area very well. Now, once these extensions are made, as I explained earlier, it is going to be very clear with this, what we aim by making obturators in this area or of the soft palate is that during function, this lateral pharyngeal wall is going to contact this area as well as the posterior pharyngeal wall is going to contact this area. So it's going to be a total seal because of which the patient is going to be able to swallow and the fluid is not going to escape or leak into the nose or this area is going to be active only during function. Remember, this area should not be in contact all the time. It should be in contact only during function. So we record it in such an area that these muscles give their functional recordings here at these borders. So what will happen with this two things? One, the patient can very well eat whatever he wants. Swallowing won't be a problem. Speech won't be effective because certain kind of plosive sounds, certain kind of nasal sounds can easily be <clears throat> done when the patient wants certain gap or certain air thrust into the nose for certain sounds like N and G. There the patient's going to be very easily having this gap where he can easily speak because this is a passive prosthesis. It will be active when only when you swallow or you thrust when these pharyngeal walls or these lateral walls will be active. So here what we do is we border mold these areas. Now how do you border mold these areas? You tell the patient to do all the activities. You tell the patient to swallow. You tell the patient to uh, speak certain words. You tell the patient to put the head down. Tell the patient to rotate the head so that this area is recorded. Now for an ideal uh, impression you would see that and you can make a final impression with any kind of disclosing wax. What you can see that over here is that this area height should be at least 10 to 15 mm into the nasopharynx so that the blockage takes place and nicely the patient can execute its function. So here is uh, one of the cases where uh, I've taken this from one of the articles where this has been replaced with the help of the prosthesis. Now you can see very well that during function, these pharyngeal muscles are in contact and there's a small area that is a pad you can call it the passive enrich which of the 
pharynx which is in contact here with the posterior wall and the entire seal is completed and the patient can eat drink and speak very well now also uh, another article says that this defect changes its shape and size with time and here you can see that a patient who had an obstetra of this size when remade came with an obstetra of this size this means the muscles also keep adapting all the time to your tissues so that the changes can take place so a uh, second thing when you uh, change make these uh, obturators for the nasopharynx you should it should be kept in mind that these obturator surfaces should be concave not convex if they are convex it's going to irritate the dorsum of the tongue and the patient is going to keep gagging all the time and swallowing is also going to be a little difficult so further as i said that for retentive purposes if you do not have enough structure or you don't have enough teeth you can go in and you're lucky enough to have a good premaxillary bone left you can go in with implants uh, once a, a good time after irradiation is completed so you can go in with implants or prosthesis and as i said that the most favorable defects are the defects where the premaxilla has been uh, say conserved during surgeries so that the patient can easily go in with osteo included implants for better retentive aids now a uh, meatal obturators these obturators are obturators now uh, where it is a part of the nasopharynx complex only now when i talk about this part of my obturator say in an edentulous patient this part is also covering the posterior part of the nose say it is between now i see this diagram it will be clearer now this is the nasopharynx oral cavity this is your soft palate okay during function the soft palate touches the pharynx now because of say whatever reason the resection was huge or it is an edential patient the concave was also removed during radical section so what happens is the entire most of the soft palate plus the concave is removed where to take the retention from so you try to go vertical into the defect here so what do you do is the uh, prosthesis is here and it is extended vertical into the defect in this area so what you can see is the prosthesis defected into the the prosthesis extended into the nasopharynx over here okay so this is into the distal aspect of the maxillary prosthesis now what you can see here that two important parts is we make two small holes in this prosthesis here why two small holes because concave is what concave is something which increases the surface area of your nasal cavity by making those uh, concave so by making these concave you are going to somewhere you know remove this concave section prosthesis in the concave you are going to uh, interfere with the uh, air flow and the nasal breathing pattern so you need these two holes so that your oro um, uh your oropharyngeal breathing is not interfered in these cases so the next part is congenital defect congenital defect is uh something which is a little bit difficult and uh different from that what a uh, say acquired defect is because here the prosthodontist has a very bare minimal role mostly it is either for the replacement of the prosthetic part completely once uh, the entire surgical and orthodontic part is done so the cleft palate is a uh, seen as a midline defect of the lip or the palate all of us are very well versed with it so the treatments of the cleft lip and the cleft palate you have like a lot of treatment which goes over till the entire growth period okay so treatment can involve a team of professionals orthodontists surgeons uh, pediatricians uh, oral surgeons a lot of people work in this and a prosthodontist also i will just go directly to the role of what a prosthodontist is going to do in this so the first thing uh, is something called as a naso alveolar molding appliance so it's going to be a hell of a task make an impression for that little thing which is who's already so uh, troubled with what's happening everything he's eating is coming out of the nose he's not able to speak not able to swallow so somewhat we try to make the impression with a silicon putty material we pour a cast out of it once the cast is poured we make a acrylic plate on it and which has this can be heat cured and it has a small extension over here now what is the use of this prosthesis what do we do is we place this into the mouth we place bands on both the sides we have bands which are tied to the prosthesis so now these bands are going to pull the prosthesis from both the sides like this so this side is going to be attached banded here this side is going to be banded here so now when these muscles and there's going to be excess pressure from outside like this the 
palate is palatal bone is going to grow at a greater speed and it's trying to going to try to you know join or fuse at the mid palatine sutures or how much ever it can apart from it there is also something you can see that the because the alveoli of the nose in these patients are collapsed a lot of time uh, uh, so here there is a small part which is going to be a nasal extension which is going to push that uh, nasal uh, muscle so that the aperture is also made with time this is what happens as and when the healing takes place this is what happens with this patient and if for example it's a bilateral defect you can make two apertures and you can make two extensions for the patient so that it can easily be done for both the sides so uh, the last part of the obturator is uh, part here is speech aid prosthesis now Uh, all of you all are so well versed with the anatomy and the function. I've repeated it a lot of times uh, during this uh, presentation itself. So we have two problems. One is where the resection has taken place. What do we do with this problem? Where you can say it's an, a neuromuscular problem or it is a problem which was say a congenital issue. So here we have two problems. One is the velopharyngeal competence, and we have the uh, velopharyngeal insufficiency. Now, what is an incompetence? Now, for example, in certain AI patients, the soft palate is paralyzed, say for whatever reason. So So this is not going to uh, get elevated during functions. So the patient is going to uh, go through a lot of problem. Similarly, in a insufficiency cases, this had not grown till its entire length what it was supposed to grow. So again, the patient has that problem. So in these cases, how we discuss about the meatal obturators, a small extension can go into the nasal pharynx and do whatever help it can. and apart from this in incompetent patient we do something called as the palatal lift prosthesis or we do something that is called a speech aid prosthesis so what's going to happen in that a prosthesis which is going to help you elevate this muscle and reach here so it's going to help in function because it's going to help in elevate this paralyzed muscle now you cannot give a speech aid prosthesis in all patients now there are certain patients in which this muscle is partially active in those cases it's going to be very rigid it is it's going to keep cause the patient a little bit of gag because it's going to keep pushing the prosthesis touching the dorsum part of the tongue the patient is going to gag so before doing that test this muscle with the help of a mouth mirror if it is completely uh, say lifeless or it is completely mobile go in for the palatal lift prosthesis so what will happen here is you make this um say the part of your cast partial or your denture and you have this small extension which is going to lift your palate from this area so once the palate is lifted from this area over here it is lifted to this portion here and the patient gets again to that barrier between the nose and the mouth and the nasopharynx oropharynx and the patient starts speaking again coming down to the mandibular defects now the mandibular defects are going to be say so whatever reasons maybe it is any kind of carcinoma uh, any of the floor of the mouth or the tongue so <clears throat> very basic prosthesis are made for the mandible we make guiding flanges because once your resection or hemimandibotomy has taken place the muscles cause this huge problem trismus is one problem and your muscles try to go uh, try to pull uh, your entire uh, lower mandible to the side of the defect because of extra contraction or the extra healing so because of this we try to get it onto the other side so that the mastication of the patient is possible with the help of the palatal extensions of these guiding flanges you have wide palatal ramp say the uh, lower cannot come the mandible cannot come to completely in occlusion so we try to extend the occlusal table so the patient can at least masticate on this ramp we have mandibular guiding flanges which can help pull the mandible and keep it in occlusion towards the non resected side now one of this case uh, which i have also published in one of the journals this patient came to me and uh, this patient was still uh, having a very compromised uh, mand maxillary uh, teeth area so this area was resected also for the patient this is the x ray of the hemimandibular tomy that had taken place in the patient now you can see here that i cannot use too much of guiding flange here because already this area has so much compromised prosthesis and the chemotherapy was just over say 7 or 8 months i could not afford losing a teeth uh, to avoid osteoarthritis necrosis so what i did is something very different i try to make an interim prosthesis and i gave a good groove here where the upper teeth could come and rest into the groove and this itself acted as a guiding prosthesis now you can see a very good uh, change here where some what the deviation of the mandible could had or could have overcome because of this reason because this is without the prosthesis and this is just with the prosthesis and you can see how well <coughs> the patient um, has corrected on the deviation part and i have published this article again in international journal of case reports 
So this is another case where a hemimaxillectomy had taken place for this patient. Again, the same problem that the defect was going towards a resected site. The, the mandible was getting deviated towards a resected site. So what we do, what we did is we made a small extension here so that it could be locked here. Your mandible could be locked here and it could uh, the muscles could get accustomed to staying in this position eventually. So this acted as a physiotherapy also for this patient. Again, we have tongue prosthesis in certain areas where the tongue also has to be resected. Say, for example, the entire tongue. What does this patient do next? He can't eat. He can't swallow. He can't speak. So what we do is we try to somewhat make something which can act like a tongue because we cannot make a mobile tissue, of course, but we can make something which can help in the barrier method. We can make these grooves here so that the food bolus can be entered into the mouth. We try to make this area so that the, this can be pressed against the palate to help in swallowing when the mandible moves. Apart from this, we can also uh, help uh, in patient aiding in speech because of the uh, tongue and the prosthetic part touching the palate, the resonation is better, the patient can speak a lot of words. And then after this, we can see that the patient is highly motivated because the prognosis is good. So uh, the mandibular defects, the miserly defects and the tongue prosthesis and wall was very exhausting, I know. And now the part which is more of a say cosmetic part comes into it. Now we go to extra oral defects. So the extra oral defect, we will directly go to what it exists. So the first thing is the ear prosthesis. Yes, ear prosthesis does come in maxillofacial prosthetics. And this is the place where you can say a cosmetic surgeon uh, calls you up and says that, uh, hey, dog, I'm not able to, you know, get that tissue. It keeps collapsing. The ear that I con constructed keeps collapsing. Can you do something with the cosmetic part of it? And your a maxillofacial prosthodontist comes into being. So what do we do is... We have cases like this, where you have a part of the ear collapsed or resected, you have congenitally missing, you have bilaterally missing part of the ear, but these are somewhat unfavorable defects because on a mobile tissue, a prosthesis can never stay. So what do we actually want when we want to work on a prosthesis where we have to replace a ear? We generally look for cases as a microfacial prosthodontist when we see that the tragus is staying there or we have the tragus there in that area after the surgical resection. Why simple? Because the margin of the prosthesis is going to hide behind the tragus and it is going to give you very, very good amount of that aesthetic look and uh, apart from that, the tragus is going to help you hide the anterior margin of the prosthesis and, going to, and it's going to make Make it look more natural. We generally want that this defect area is lined with a skin graft if it is if the ear was surgically removed for say any kind of on go reasons. So this is the reason why we want a skin graft because if it is a nice skin graft, we won't have repeated infection. It would be easily um, maintained, and we can use good amount of adhesives in this area. So uh, this is one of my cases uh, where uh, we uh, had an, a, a contact with an oral surgeon or an onco surgeon and a cosmetic surgeon uh, who were into bean and the cosmetic surgeon uh, tried to build this up. This was a congenitally missing ear. So I was called into the picture. Now this patient had already gone seven types of surgeries. I was not very happy with the aesthetic part because this kind of ear was lower than this ear. But I advised the patient if she could get rid of this part so that I can give her a more symmetrical prosthesis but she was already so bored with so many incisions and so many surgeries that she didn't want to go and she said jo hai, jaisa isi pe bana do. so we went ahead with this case we made impressions for this case after making impressions uh, we made molds a three piece mold and we tried to carve the ear onto this once the ear was carved, we did a try and as I said, I was not very happy with the margins because this was at a lower level, but we couldn't help it. We tried not to cover this area, but it didn't look that good and the prosthesis keep, kept bumping on this tissue. So we tried to get an undercut from this area for this patient. Now, uh, after this was done, we manipulated the silicon material and we fabricated the silicon material. Now, there are a lot of methods how we do it. You can either do an injection molding technique into it and then you can uh, polymerize it so that it gives you uh, excellent details. A lot of coloring methods are there. Some are extrinsic, some are intrinsic colors. Extrinsic colors are better because you can uh, duplicate them very well. 
and then you have a uh, coloration of different uh, types like with the help of shade guides you can you know try to get them beautiful and artistic and then you can do a little bit of deglossing so that you know it gives you a more natural look so uh, this is how we uh, retrieved the prosthesis. We did a bit of try in on her. And this is how it looked uh, for the patient. Uh, and I tried to put that little earring there so that I can somewhat, you know, overcome the uh, level. And the patient was very happy because she was happy to see that she has ear and uh, on the other side also, she can wear a earring nicely on the other side also. And she can tie her hair behind also because she's kept opening her hair from one side to hide the defect. This is how the patient look and I try to hide this margin because whenever I try to extend my prosthesis till this area, it kept bumping off from the tissue. So I tried to hide it at this margin. So with the help of a earring uh, part, I tried to hide the margin of the prosthesis and it was an adhesive age prosthesis. Nowadays, CAT CAM procedures are coming in a lot for uh, this because you have 3D prototyping. And you have CAT cams where uh, because of 3D prototyping, your, your process is almost ready. You don't have to do so much, uh, um, what do you say, technical aspect work. And if it comes to you for sculpting, it is very easy. Divide it into different, different square areas and try to replicate that in your uh, wax pattern. You'll be easily able to do that. If, for example, see this small area, it's so easy to replicate this area exactly in this area. Rather, if you see it as a whole, it will be difficult to replicate this area. So divide it into equal compartments so that you can replicate that particular compartment in that particular area. So now coming to margin placement, very, very important. If you have the tragus, bingo, it's very good. You can hide it behind the tragus and you will be so uh, happy aesthetically that you will not identify whether it is a prosthesis or it's a natural ear. If you don't have the tragus, simple thin the borders so that it can blend into the skin very easily if the skin does not bounce out like it was happening in my case. Blend it in very thin on the skin so that the, it again doesn't look and can be retained with adhesives. So these are some partial ear defects, small ear defects, which are again replaced. Again, as I said that if you have partial defects, it is not at all uh, favorable, but I have picked this up from an article where they have been very successfully able to replace it with the help of aesthetic, with the help of adhesives. So also if retention is an issue and the ear processes keeps falling off, even after the adhesive, there is something, something called as um, uh, cochlear implants <clears throat> which are coming into being a lot and you can put it into the mastoid process here the only thing is that try to keep that area clean extract the patient that area should be clean otherwise peri implantitis develops here in this area which might cause problem and then the you can you can have all the other problems and the patient is going to keep complaining of irritation and not wear your prosthesis coming down to the almost the last part that is the orbital prosthesis and ocular prosthesis now we have two kind of prosthesis for your eye now till uh, you can replace an eye you can replace an eye but it's no more the time where you know people roam like those pirates and you know wear that one eye covered you know so it's the time where a prosthodontist comes and you know gives you those eye part over there and you don't have to hide if you don't have a eye you can at least look cosmetically good so coming to the orbital defect, again, we want all the defects to be lined with good skin grafts. We don't want uh, you to retain the eyelids without any reason because eyelids are just going to interfere with the process because any mobile tissue is not going to let the prosthesis sit on there. When you talk about dentures, flabby tissues always cause problem and movement in the prosthesis. So when you talk about orbital prosthesis, what we want is a nicely lined defect. We don't want eyelids. If possible, the eyebrows should be retained to some extent, but it's okay. Now this kind of defect you can say is kind of acceptable defect, but defects like this where the eyelids have been preserved is not possible because you can see here, it's not possible to replace the defect at all because uh, inside the socket, there is no place on the orbital uh, area. I cannot replace because the eyelid is going to keep moving and fishing the defects out. Further, you can see in this case also, we don't have enough area for the orbital processes to rest on. So we need a perfectly lined defect and we need a perfectly uh, lined, um, uh, what do you say, made defect if possible. Ask your surgeon to do those corrections and send the patient back to you if the patient uh, agrees to do so. So coming down to impressions of a nice orbital defect, you place your impression material, place gauze on it, place some adhesive, put plaster on it. So you will be having a whole mold over here. Is going to look somewhat like this. Now, in this area, what you're going to do is just place your. Uh, so sorry, yeah, this is about 3D printing. 
yeah what you're going to do is just place an eyelid you get ready made uh, eyeballs you know like you get those prosthetic eyeballs at a lot of places take those eyeballs place it in your uh, socket do some wax up and do some nice wax up which is going to give you and uh, look which is similar to the skin around it once you do the wax up see the wax up from different 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 areas try to uh, center the eyeball with help of the other prosthesis do your uh, nice glasses if you want to hide the margins of the prosthesis try that how it looks with the glasses also now after this try to see it from different angles if you're very artistic if you can send it to a good lab the lab will give you these very nice uh, lines and very nice effects after this uh, you can go uh, and uh, look at the orbital folds show it to your patient go ahead with the uh, flasking part add your silicon material to the part around it once you deflask it you add the silicon material around it once you add a silicon material and your eye prosthesis is ready you place your eyelids in those areas and here the patient is ready to go wear those amazing prosthesis now what i skipped uh, now in the slide behind Yeah, here. Nowadays, you have again maxillofacial prosthodontics coming up with CAD CAM a lot, where you know they just scan your optical impression and you directly get your um, prosthesis out, or you can get your cast with the help of these CAD CAM models. So, uh, 3D printing developing in India, if it develops, maxillofacial prosthesis is going to have a boon for these patients because it's going to be really easy and uh, it will be less technical sensitive. Okay. So, uh, for further, uh, say, retention, you can even go for orbital implants. It is mostly placed in the supraorbital rims because they say that it has good periosteal uh, blood supply. So here is the case. The only thing is that maintaining the thing is very important. You don't have to uh, end up getting those peri-implantitis in those areas. Cleanliness is maintained is very important. There is another kind of implant uh, which are placed in the socket. Everything is enucleated. It is placed at the time of surgery behind the ocular content. Okay. And this area is sealed. It's just a little bit of extra knowledge. Something just come up very well. And you have a porous uh, polythene orbital implant which is placed into that socket. Once that placed into the socket, you have this small uh, nail kind of magnetic attachment on which your uh, orbital prosthesis is going to attach. This is done very, very rarely, but something which has come up and is going on since a lot of time. Coming to ocular prosthesis, now in orbital prosthesis, the entire content was removed. In ocular prosthesis, you have the eyelids and you have just the enucleation of the socket that is done. So now this was a patient who was referred to us and he had severe inflammation with the old prosthesis. So in this patient uh, with uh, talking to the ophthalmologist and talking to certain surgeons, they said, you can go ahead, we control the inflammation with medicines. And here we had the patient when he was ready for uh, the eye prosthesis because he had been wearing it from quite a lot of time. We made impressions with a very, very simple technique with the help of say the uh, the, the syringe uh, cover and we uh, placed the made the impressions with the help of nice alginates and after that we made trays and we border molded this area very well we got the cast done after getting the cast done and after doing the centering and everything we got a very nice uh, eye prosthesis which is readily available we did the borders with the help of the cast with the help of the cast we did the borders and we did the placement and then this is how the patient looked when we gave the patient the prosthesis Okay, so the nasal prosthesis, of course, we have nasal defects also. Nose prosthesis is also part of maxillofacial prosthodontics. You replace the nose. You have to just keep in mind that you have to keep in mind these areas. You have to keep in mind the area of the, say, above the filtrum, the columella of the nose should be really well. The ala of the nose sh should be designed very well and your prosthesis should hide behind this area. Some basic principles and you can go very well with maxillofacial prosthesis. You have staining, which is very important because it's going to uh, catch the eye of the uh, person who's going to look at you. We also have integrated implants for good retention. Like you have this areas, you can place it either in the floor of the nose or the glabella and you can retain your prosthesis. 
So again, we have the combined nasal prosthesis and cheek prosthesis where you have the obturator with the nose or you have the obturator with, uh, say, the entire hemifacial prosthesis. These are all different types of maxillofacial prosthodontics. You even have areas where you also replace uh, fingers, which is to some extent done because I remember doing a finger case uh, in my college, but after that uh, in private practice, not referred. Uh, so custom fitted uh, silicon prosthetic devices are nowadays uh, made by a lot of people and maxillofacial prosthodontists do it to some extent. You have mid-facial defects, maybe it's a gunshot injury for this patient, again from an article, a big kind of a defect and this entire defect was replaced. A lot of work was done in this patient, um, which I referred from the article. The, uh, the work was done with the help of on the nose part, it was done on the obturator front, the teeth were replaced for the patient and it was giving a patient a new life. In short, materials that we use for doing all these things you use acrylics polyurethanes and silicon elastomers you have hell lot of materials everybody is coming up with the research on materials but just keep it simple what you should know is if i am getting a prosthesis it is acrylics polyurethane silicon or elastomers you have uh, retention aids we have discussed all of them with wires glass with buttons adhesives magnetics with implants we have different different kind of uh, attachments which can be used for retention because retention is a challenge. Now, also in cases, we can even go for uh, retention with the help of glasses. Imagine how well a nose prosthesis is going to sit there with the help of glasses and eye prosthesis on an unfavorable defect with the glasses. Adhesives, as I said, plays a very big role in this. You have magnetic attachments where if you have a facial defect and you have an obturator, so what you can do is a magnetic attachment between the defect and the obturator. So it's going to help to, uh, you know, uh, move the entire prosthesis together. Coloration, you're going to have colors, which you're going to uh, do it. Your lab is going to do it most of the time for you. So it's not going to be very difficult for you to uh, think about the colors. So basically uh, summarizing my entire session by talking about maxillofacial prosthetics, I want that all of us should try and binge into this part of the dentistry, which is quite untouched when it comes to uh, practicing uh, dentistry in our country. Because uh, losing uh, your uh, body parts to these defects is not end of life, but a beginning of new journey, which is not going to be possible till and when we are going to help these patients function back to their life and be there and stand neck to neck with the oncosurgeons. Because it is very well said in the book by the man himself, Dr. Bumer Curtis, who says is that an oncosurgeon should always consult a prosthodontist before he cuts that part so that he knows whether replacement is possible or not. So try getting into maxillofacial, build up your interest. I hope the entire basic for you is clear. You know what maxillofacial prosthodontist is. You know that what part of prosthodontics it covers. So these are all what I had to say. And ultimately, just one thing, eat well, sleep well, be happy, keep smiling, make your patients smile. And you can be in touch with me through all these things. And any doubts, I'm always there. And I hope you are going to touch those aspects, try understanding, try uh, directing your patients to the right part when these patients come to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. It was a great, great session. And you explained everything very beautifully in this short time. So, ma'am, it is great to see and learn how a prosthodontist in the long-term management aids in restoring function, aesthetics, and also psychological enhancement for the patient so that he returns back to his life. So, uh, we would be taking up questions now. Dr. Akshita? Yes, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am, for such an informative presentation. We have a few questions. If you permit, shall I proceed? Yeah, please, please. Yes. So the first question we have is how much time shall we wait for going in for implants in a patient post radiotherapy and do they succeed in terms of osseointegration? integration? Okay, so osseointegration integration has been this big, big doubt because osteo necrosis is this big thing which comes up with radiation therapy. As I mentioned that we should ideally wait for one to one and a half year before we go into implants. And if you're placing implants, go give that hyperbaric oxygen to the patient so that somewhere or the other, you can, you know, take care and, you know, not, uh, you know, get into the radio necrotic phase and uh, implants in uh, in uh, maxillofacial prosthodontics is one of the most upcoming thing because with all that resected, implants is going to give you that extra retention. Go in for it, but wait for one and a half to two years. Ma'am, the next question we have is, what is the main consideration which should be taken care in case of maxillofacial prosthesis? 
uh, consideration uh, as in in which aspect mom the overall consideration about uh, overall consideration procedures... the simple thing is you should be able to replace it and if you're not able to replace it you should be able to not play around with the patient because it's very simple there are cases where patients come with trismus and they have a big defect and they're referred to you and in a lot of cases you're not going to be able to make those impressions say no to the patient say you cannot make the prosthesis it doesn't make any sense if you can't record it you can't make it and talking about the scope you should be able to get the defect functionally uh, you know right like technically right if the prosthesis is not serving you the process or not serving you the function it's going to be a fail so try to uh, be true to yourself true to the patient and give the patient a prosthesis which is functionally active ma'am the last question for today we have is what type of failures are associated with maxillofacial prosthesis a lot of failures a lot of failures first the first question itself also radio necrosis happens in a lot of cases where you try second the patient just does not adapt you have ulcerative tissue you have friction everywhere if the patient is uh, say for example very close to when he finishes radiotherapy he'll keep having frictions in a lot of places he has dry mouth so the process is not going to be retentive it's if it's a uh, uh, say edentulous patient who's come for an obturator to you there's the process keeps falling it's not going to be adhesive it's not going to be it's not going to adhere because if the adhesive is failing all the time the patient has skin infections the patient doesn't wear the patient is not compliant with the prosthesis so there are a lot of things okay if the tissue keeps collapsing if the tissue keeps contracting too much the prosthesis keeps failing a lot of time so there are a lot of shortcomings also to maxillofacial prosthesis but if you try to do these things in a uh, you know when is the right time to place the prosthesis if you place it middle of the healing the prosthesis will fail always wait for the healing be patient work with interim prosthesis then only go for definitive ones thank you ma'am for solving all our queries and uh, i would also like to thank dr anmol bagaria ma'am and team sinoden for organizing this event and also my co-host dr yogeshwari ma'am and now i would like to uh, invite dr anmol bagaria ma'am to conclude the session with a few words thank you thank you for being with us uh, this evening i hope you are enjoying the learning experience with us i would like to thank uh, pinky ma'am for giving us her valuable time this evening and for enhancing our knowledge and skills thank you so much ma'am for delivering such an informative lecture today i hope i could do justice it's a very vast topic i just try to cover everything i don't know if i could do justice but oh yes it's a very uh, vast thing and thank you for having me here thank you dr yogeshwari dr akshita and dr anmol thank you for having me over thank you ma'am ma'am i'm ending this session oh, session for today